Welcome everybody. My name is Maria O'Brien and I'm a lecturer on the MA in Arts Management at Queen's University Belfast. I'm delighted to be able to host this event on behalf of our MA to have our MA showcase event. Thank you very much to all of those who have taken time out of their day to attend our showcase event. We're delighted to bring together academic expertise and new voices in the world of cultural and creative industries. I want to thank the organizers of the Festival of Social Sciences for all the financial and organizational support, including some amazing training opportunities. The Economic and Social Research Council Festival of Social Science is an annual UK-wide free celebration of the social sciences. And the aims of the festival are to encourage, support and create opportunities for social science researchers to engage with non-academic audiences, to promote and increase awareness of the social sciences and ESRC funded research, and to promote and increase awareness of the contribution social science makes to the well-being and economy of society in the UK. And it also enables the public to engage with social science research. We very much hope that our event today meets those aims. The MA in Arts Management at Queen's University Belfast is outward looking and internationally focused. Our students come from all corners of the world to develop skills and knowledge of the global cultural and creative industries. The importance of arts and culture to society is ever increasing and we're proud to spearhead graduate training in this field. Our students have gone on to work in many diverse sectors and always make us proud. Our aim in the MA programme is to provide our students with advanced understanding of, art, of the subject of arts management, advanced knowledge and understanding of the most up-to-date theories and discourses in arts management and how these are influencing practice. We, we look at knowledge of international trends in cultural policy and how these are affected and affected, affected by the practice of arts management, essential practical skills relating to arts management, including strategic planning, financial management, business planning, and engaging audiences, um, and awareness of different research methodologies and wider intellectual and transferable skills. This MA showcase is a crucial part of these objectives. It gives a selection of our students the chance to present their cutting edge research work. We would have loved to have been able to showcase the research work of all of our students, but time constraints mean that we cannot do so. We have selected three students who have prepared short videos outlining the importance of their work and will play these shortly. We're also very honored to continue to show the international links in our field. Dr. Jing Go from Monash University has agreed to present on her work as part of our MA showcase. We're delighted to have the opportunity to hear from her firsthand. Dr. Jing Go is an expert appointed by the UNESCO 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expression since 2019. She is Director of the Master of Cultural and Creative Industries at Monash University in Australia. Her policy work focuses on the transformation of creative cities and the creative economy in the Global South. Dr. Jing Go has worked with culture agencies in China, Cambodia, Indonesia and Thailand to develop cultural strategies and cultural policies. She's the author of a report commissioned by the International Federation of Arts Councils and the Culture Agencies on the social aspect of culture work, launched this year as part of UNESCO's global conference, Mondia Cult. Go's current research focuses on the digital creative economy and its impact on diversity of cultural expression, cultural participation and cultural diplomacy. Her books include Red Creatives, published in 2020 with Intellect, Reimagining Creative Cities in 21st Century Asia, published in 2020 with Palgrave Macmillan, and forthcoming with Routledge, Creative Subjectivity in the Cultural Industries. But first, we're going to watch the pre-recorded videos from our three students from our MA. So if you could just put, hold on for a minute and we will watch those. Thank you all. Hi, I'm Sheena, and this is my research, Visibility in the Arts. For decades, disabled people have been marginalized within society, faced discrimination, and had their voices frequently excluded. In recent years, we have seen the representation of disability become more prevalent in mainstream media, 
and a rise in festivals dedicated to presenting the work of disabled artists. While there are positive steps in the right direction, there is still a question why 27 years from the Disability Discrimination Act was implemented, there's still a significant underrepresentation of disabled people in the cultural workforce. This research aimed to examine the barriers visually impaired dancers face when accessing the dance sector in Northern Ireland. It was completed through a multi-method approach, which included the lived experiences of three visually impaired dancers alongside practice-based research methods, which use dance as a tool for data collection. One of the most significant findings that I had not anticipated was the relevance of the methodological process. Incorporating a multi-method approach reveals more about the research topic than expected. For instance, using dance unraveled different layers and interrogated the participants' embodied experiences in a familiar way to them. Following a four-stage workshop design, explore, share, describe, and respond, meant the participants not only critically analysed their own discoveries, but also each other's, further adding to the depth of knowledge gathered. This highlighted similarities in experiences, as well as demonstrating just how individual each experience is. Most importantly, the role of dance as a research tool created a level playing field for all participants, and this was continued throughout with the decision to not include video or photography elements. The most prominent finding was just how challenging it is to be inclusive. The complexities and nuances which impact accessibility are immense. Simply offering audio description at your performance or workshop does not necessarily mean it is accessible. As highlighted by one participant who said, the area of sight loss is such a wide spectrum, I had to accept that my creative audio description cannot necessarily cater for everyone. Whilst no one solution can be offered, we can conclude that the inclusion of lived experiences will be integral to moving forward with the goal of inclusion. A question I kept coming back to was where does responsibility lie? Whilst it can be agreed that the voice of the disabled person is integral to move forward, it should be noted that the heavy reliance on disabled people to always initiate change could in turn absolve others from responsibility. What I found within the research was the gap in connecting the access issues and underrepresentation to the inherent ableist structures which exist. Whether that's a lack of dance training with many disabled dancers learning on the job or how many art policies fail to deal with structural issues such as the uncertain working conditions, funding structures and the often freelance nature of the work, all of which perpetuate the inequality of the sector. Simply highlighting complex barriers without taking responsibility for the broader issues at play would be entirely inadequate. Finally, understanding that the benefit of inclusion is not only to the advantage of the disabled dancer, but also the wider dance sector is important to note. By increasing the visibility of the visually impaired dancer, we have the opportunity to create a new and innovative paradigm of dance. The development of copyright in China. My research is about the development of copyright in China and its impact on the digital music industry. Copyright aims to protect the economic and the moral rights of authors, to incentive more creations, and from a utilitarian perspective, to benefit the society and the economy. Recently, copyright has become increasingly globalized, and the impetus of developed countries also criticize more rights as the developed countries are rich in cultural assets and being copyright exporters. The enforcement of copyright, especially in developing nations, are seen as hegemonic unfair, even neo-colonial. In China, that fact that China is a socialist country and a complex history has profound implications for copyright development. Previously, China has always remained a feudal dynasty, and the alleged copyright protection in history was meant to consolidate the domination of the rulers. Recently, as a condition for a scientific and trade cooperation with the United States, it was only at the demand of the USA that the past of copyright in China began to be formally explored. Chinese copyright can be seen as having been developed passively in accordance with the best requirements. The China has the largest number of music internet users in the world. However, in the decade without substantial copyright protection, 
China's digital music platforms grew haphazardly and pirated music up to 99%. This self-destructive development without copyright protection has triggered a significant attention from the government. In 2015, the government strengthened the implementation of copyright as the most powerful market control tool. When copyright was recognized by the official, copyright has gradually become an entry ticket in the digital music industry. In China, an exclusive licensing model has gradually formed, unlike Western. Exclusive means that the copyrights are only available to one music platform. Other platforms have no access. This exclusive has led to copyright price gouging wars between different music platforms due to the sky-high copyright fees. The number of music platforms in China has plummeted from 400 in a decade to the current two music platform companies, Tencent and NetEase. With Tencent consolidating its monopoly position through copyright price competition, one view is that copyright had put the country's digital music industry on the right track. The Chinese music market represents an impressive 96% of legitimate music and has jumped into the sixth largest music market in the world. However, Chinese digital music industry has become fractured by the copyright price fighting and ultimately benefiting the Western monopoly record labels. In China's sky high copyright price bidding environment, one has to wonder if this model doesn't push music platforms like Tencent to promote their leading artists and make more profit at the expense of art artists. And the users are not provided with a better service and have to download different music platforms, pay multiple times to get the music they want. Creators continue to struggle for their livelihood despite the higher copyright fees. Copyright isn't really perfect from this perspective. Thank you. We don't need permission to dance, BTS sing in the chorus of their catchy English hit. But do the structures of the K-pop industry intertwine with artistic freedom? My dissertation focused on how the K-pop music industry has responded to issues of creative labour and contracts stemming from my own passion for K-pop and how it is a unique music scene from those that have been previously dominant in the music industry. Beginning of my research, I found a lack of academic writings about K-pop generally, and what had been written was limited in terms of the scope of research of how the industry itself operates and how it has changed over time. Therefore, I chose to do a comparative analysis of four generations of K-pop's creative labour practices, relying more heavily on grey literature from both Western and East Asian sources in an attempt to ensure any personal bias on my part and any bias by the authors of the literature I was reading was being challenged, and balancing these readings with academic literature on issues of creative labour in the music industry more generally and how it is relevant to the K-pop music industry. But what significance does this research have? K-pop as a music industry is growing at an exponential rate, not only displaying financial significance, but also cultural significance, becoming a central part of the music conversation in South Korea and globally. The performers of K-pop, also known as idols, experience a unique training and management system that, from an arts management perspective, is an interesting one to explore, as although it shares similarities with Western music models, it is more overtly criticised, with many Western media outlets focusing on the dark side of K-pop. Through my research, I found that this training and management system does possess a dark side, such as strict beauty standards exhibited through increased pressure to conform to beauty standards and have plastic surgery, and managerial control over the trainees and idols' personal relationships, such as rules against dating and limited contact between family and friends during training. However, it is important to note that this system has been allowed to develop due to cultural differences in which what some people deem as unacceptable practice is the cultural and societal norm elsewhere. In the case of K-pop, South Korea culturally has a different standard of beauty and work ethic. And while this puts unprecedented pressure on the individuals involved in these systems and demonstrates a pattern of problematic behaviors, it is important to take note of this cultural perspective. 
Increased global success has been a significant contributing factor to the added pressure for the trainees and idols, but it has also allowed for increased scrutiny to be highlighted within the system, with advocacy on the parts of bands and K-pop groups themselves leading to fundamental changes within the system, such as the rise of an alternative system in which idols have a higher level of agency and collaboration between artists and their agencies in terms of the music itself and the image of the group is being normalised. However, that is not to say the system is now devoid of creative labour issues, and I believe that further academic study into the subject will allow for a more comprehensive and complex debate on the main issues to take place. Limitations of the dissertation format meant that I left a lot of avenues unexplored, such as the mandatory military service young male South Koreans, including idols, must serve. Therefore, with the rise in K-pop's world domination not appearing to decline anytime soon, now is the time to explore the industry, not only scrutinising it through white hegemony, but challenging our personal perceptions of what good training and management is from a global perspective. I would like to take the time to thank Dr. Kim Marie Spence for her guidance and inspiring me throughout the dissertation process and the entire staff in the MA Arts Management course for their support throughout my degree. And thank you to everyone for listening today. What wonderful inspirational work from our students. Um, we're next going to hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Jingo. I'm going to do a brief introduction again because I know we have a few people who've joined since I did the first intro, if that's okay. Dr. Go is an expert appointed by the UNESCO 2005 Convention on the Promotion and Protection of Diversity of Cultural Expression. She's a director of the Masters of Cultural and Creative Industries at Monash University in Australia, and we're particularly grateful for her participation in this event, given the time difference, which makes it really, really late in Australia. Um, her policy work focuses on the transformation of creative cities and the creative economy in the global south. She's worked with culture agencies in China, Cambodia, Indonesia and Thailand to develop cultural strategies and cultural policies. She's the author of a report commissioned by the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies on the social aspects of cultural work, launched this year as part of UNESCO's global conference, Mondia Cult. Her current research focuses on the digital creative economy and the impact of diversity of, on diversity of cultural expression, cultural participation and cultural diplomacy. She has a number of books published, including Red Creatives, and reimagining creative cities in 21st century Asia and has forthcoming creative subjectivity in the cultural industries. Thank you very much for agreeing to take part in our event. After the talk, there will be a Q&A with both our guest, Jing Go, and our three students whose work you've just seen. So please do raise any questions you have in the chat and we will, we will funnel them to our guest speaker and to our students. And finally, thank you to our lovely three students who presented their work. We're really, really proud of the wonderful work you've done and it's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, so is that my turn now? Yes, please, the stage is yours now. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. Um, thank you so much for QB. Um, to, for inviting me and uh, I'm so glad to be able to make the connection between our Master of Culture and Creative Industries at Monash in Australia with the Arts Management and Culture Policy Master at Q, uh, QUB. Um, so just bear with me, I'm going to um, bring out my slides. By the way, you can uh, have the slides after the event if you um, want to have a closer look at the event, uh, the slides. Um, so um, my talk is going to be based on a series of um, projects that I've done um, with UNESCO, as Maria just introduced. I'm a UNESCO expert under the 2005 convention. So over the past few years through the UNESCO network, I've been working on quite a few projects, um, collecting data uh, from all over the world, trying to work out um, 
the impact of COVID and also the global policy response to this crisis. So I'm going to talk to some of the issues that we've discovered through these uh, policy work um, and also uh, what are some of the key trends we believe uh, are going to shape uh, the arts and culture sector in the post-COVID world. Um, in this talk, I will ask whether the post-COVID recovery is actually feasible under the current creativity discourse, by which I, I'm referring to the increasing capitalization in the culture sector driven by uh, what many in culture studies um, here and elsewhere has called um, the, um, the kind of uh, drive uh, by celebrity culture uh, in the culture and creative industries. But also there's the increasing institutionalization of the culture sector driven by culture policy measures aimed at promoting both direct and indirect economic benefits of the CCI as a new post industry um, economy. So I will kind of uh, focus on this particular report, although I will bring other evidence, policy evidences in as well. So this 2022, so just this year, this report done by UNESCO, uh, it's called Culture in Times of COVID-19 Resilience, Recovery and Revival. This report points towards a fairly terrible, dire reality of the arts and culture sector post-COVID, just two years after the pandemic started. Um, the report suggested that the pandemic reinforced rather than corrected the, the established pattern of inequality in arts and culture sector and points towards some long-term decline of the arts and culture sector. And for me, um, I think most interesting is the fact that the report discovered an even decline in the global culture sector. So developing countries suffered much more of the impact of COVID-19 than developed countries. And five main area of long-term impact of COVID um, on the culture and arts and culture sector have been identified. So you, you probably read through them um, and discovered that you, you know, knew some of them or maybe relate to some of those kind of things. But I, I would like to kind of really bring to the light some of um, the stats in this report to encourage us all to really engage more with this very, very useful, I think, uh, data sets produced by UNESCO, but also to show where might be some of the, the future research interest uh, for us all. So the UNESCO data first suggested that the revenue streams that were most affected by COVID were those that relied heavily on in-person experiences and on local and international mobility. You probably know about this already. Um, in the case of Southeast Asia, culture, culture venues and world heritage sites have been deeply affected by lockdowns, resulting in a six, uh, in around 60% of reduction in visitor rates in 2020, average 70% drop in attendance to museums and around 40 to 60% decline in revenue compared to 2019. And I think it's really important to, to understand that in some of uh, those uh, sectors in Asia, um, a lot of those culture workers uh, actually doesn't work and the, the category of culture, and they are actually work in the tourism. Therefore, they're not really eligible for culture related rescue funding during COVID. And this global unevenness is very, very uh, visible here in this category. A large share of world heritage sites in Africa, in Arab states, and in Latin America and Caribbean experienced significant decrease in subsidies in these sectors whilst you would actually see a funding increase in Europe and North America. The pandemic has made many artists a lot more uh, reliant on non-traditional funding sources, particularly uh, funding from uh, uh, revenue from um, 
uh, content streaming platforms. In the music sector, for example, the pandemic in 2020 saw uh, the increase of 18% in streaming revenues, but this is played against a 75% drop in live uh, music performances. And only a very small percentage, a portion of non-traditional revenues actually goes to individual artists. This is what the stats found out, which is quite interesting. And surprisingly also those sectors that are highly dependent on the digital rights um, recorded sectors has um, those digital rights sectors, they've recorded the largest decreases such as film and music. And if we take out the online rights, including downloads, streaming audio and videos, uh, the fall in revenue is a lot more significant. It's around 25% globally. So there's also um, the global unevenness because if, if we um, pay attention to issues such as online piracy and relatively very weak um, regulatory environments, um, you would see uh, artists based in developing countries are a lot more affected by these poor conditions than developed states. The weakening of traditional revenue streams, as mentioned before, has a direct impact on jobs and livelihoods of artists around the world. Individuals on short-term contracts and project-based employments uh, were most affected and permanent jobs in big organizations appear to be a lot more secure or insulated from the worst impacts of this pandemic, in part due to rescue fundings from governments. And this does not actually represent the reality of culture sectors as we know, because most culture sector jobs uh, are informal uh, jobs and rely very much on self-employment. So this stats from uh, UNESCO shows that in Latin America, for example, culture sectors share of um, free freelancers is around 64%. And these 64% of culture workers lost more than 80% of their income in 2020. So these, uh, this pandemic has led to significant loss of um, professional development opportunities for artists around the world, partly to do with uh, the lack of mobility and also uh, the cancellation of international tours. And this affected artists from developing countries more than developed countries due to complications around visa arrangement. And the pandemic has had an uneven impact on vulnerable groups in societies, including women, ethnic minorities, disabled people, as some of the students mentioned before, and uh, young people. And UNESCO stats show that women who hold a higher proportion of precarious jobs in arts and culture sector are particularly vulnerable. Their jobs are about 19% more at risk than men's jobs. The pandemic has also had a particular severe impact on young people and emerging artists people at the beginning of their career without any access to social capital or established professional networks face significant challenges too. The pandemic has also significantly disrupted the functioning of the culture and creative industries value chain due to um, COVID related rising operational costs and strategic supply chain challenges and new production costs, including expenses to cover hygiene products uh, and venue control, uh, the introduction of new safety protocols, even cancellation of events due to key performers contracted COVID has to isolate, things like that. Difficulties also in bringing international talents and uh, other logistical challenges have all been very significant during this period. There's again the in unevenness in how the pandemic has hit traditional culture practices particularly hard due to their imb embedded and face-to-face -face nature uh, of these practices. Some research done in Australia, for example, show that indigenous communities in remote area of the country has been uh, affected a lot more than those culture practices based in urban um, locations. 
And UNESCO also reported uh, some um, rises in other areas uh, of um, uh, the culture and arts sector. Um, so there's, for example, 39% of global increase in time spent on video gaming during pandemic. However, most streaming platforms are aggregators, as we know, where the business is based on offering free content in exchange for third party consumer data products. Under this model of free, emerging artists struggle to raise enough revenue to level anything um, that they will be um, paid before that. So this is very much the case in China with many independent artists uh, became more um, popular um, because of the streaming platforms um, demand for new content, but they will also become poorer than before because it's just not an equivalent economic model comparing to live performances. So from the audience side, 36% of the audience surveyed said they would, uh, they had enjoyed digital content, but they're expected to stop entirely when they could return uh, to the live um, performances. And only half of those audience who joined the online uh, culture consumption are expected to continue engaging with culture content at all. Uh, accessing culture content from home um, also raised very challenging questions about digital divide. Digital literacy, linguistic barriers became more of an issue for non-Anglo um, countries, with 63% of the content on the internet uh, delivered um, only in English. It has impacted specific groups of culture practitioners, um, such as those in rural and remote areas, indigenous people, ethnic minorities, vulnerable groups, people with disability and emerging artists. So digital access remains highly uneven with 37% of the global population still um, offline and most of these population concentrated in developing countries. The increased pressure on cultural workforce resulting from this pandemic has raised concern about serious loss of expertise should people leave the industry entirely. And also young pract um, practitioners may be forced uh, to look for alternative careers in other sectors as a result. And there's also a decline of grassroots organizations operating in the sector. Uh, in some developing countries, funding for uh, originally designated for grassroots organizations has to be uh, re-diverted to fund the big culture organizations. So as we all know that grassroots organizations and emerging um, uh, niche culture producers are a crucial um, source for um, diversity of culture expression, but this creativity brain drain caused by the pandemic may have significant long-term impact on the social composition of the creative cities. And we need to uh, do more research actually to look at the long-term impact of the pandemic on such diversity of culture expression. So these unevenness uh, of um, the impact and the inequality um, and long-term decline in the culture sector has triggered various kind of global culture policy responses. And UNESCO has identified five key trends um, that has been um, very um, critical in shaping the global culture policy landscape. And I encourage you to look at the UNESCO's 2022 uh, global report uh, called Reshaping Policy for Creativity. Now, I'm not going to uh, go through all of them, but I will just focus on the first two um, on in the global response to uh, really um, emphasize the culture sector's social value, but also there's a growing awareness of the importance of really ensure the livelihoods of artists and culture professionals will be guaranteed. So over the past two years, many culture organizations and artists have really strengthened their social purpose through working with local communities, including services to combat loneliness, isolation, and to improve well-being, to create it. And they also, a lot of those were involved in um, providing creative educational resources for children and families. And 
Quite interestingly, it is those organizations tended to view their creative work as part of the wider social uh, infrastructure uh, within their communities that have ad adapted really successfully to the pressure of the pandemic. So it's a win-win situation for arts and the social. The mobilization of the culture sector in response to the pandemic highlighted a very powerful role of the arts as providers of social value and governments around the world have really absorbed this element in their justification of funding supports, including support uh, to culture work. This, however, faced some significant challenges because of the precarious nature of culture work, which predates the pandemic. Globally, a larger than average share of jobs in culture sectors are informal. As the UNESCO report pointed out, more than half of the culture workforce in, the Latin, in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean region was self-employed in 2020. And without the same level of professional or formalized status afforded to culture workers in these countries, many culture professionals have very limited access to economic support or social safety nets. Governments and NGOs around the world have announced measures to protect their income, safeguarding their jobs or providing guaranteed social security. Whilst most provided a very, uh, very much needed lifeline for many people, few of these um, measures has the capacity to really deliver lasting structural changes for the sector. So in this report, Maria just mentioned I did with Effica, we tried to tackle the issue of culture work. We tried to argue that the pandemic raised our collective awareness of the need to find new and alternative frameworks to ensure the social and economic status of all of our culture professionals. And we need to use this pandemic as an opportunity to build capacity to protect artists and culture professionals' social and economic rights for the long term. How do we do that? Well, if anything, the pandemic has revealed that the current creativity narrative on which creative industries very much relied on is now truly dead, if not already amalgamated into new digital imaginaries that culture is now seeking to play a very marginal role in. The creativity discourse in the West was part of a broader imaginary of a different future than the techno-rational system of modernity attached to Fordism. This allowed the broadening of the new economy to include knowledge and skills that were previously associated with arts and culture. Alongside of this is the fast growth of the creative industry as a new economic sector of its own right. And this created an enduring field of um, conflicts, debates and discussion over the role of art culture in society. I listed a few of these key people here that leads these kind of discussions. So you probably know Adorno's Marxist critique of the culture industry. And there are also um, Nicholas Garnham, Becker and Bourdieu's attempt at uncovering the role of arts and culture industries. And more recently, um, there are um, push towards uh, popular modernism through works uh, like those of um, those by Mark Fisher. The discipline has contributed in no small part to a reimaginary of an alternative future for us all. However, what I think has been very much lacking so far is the discussion about the role of the radical social function of culture that culture has played in contemporary life. As Mark Banks, Kate Oakley, Justin O'Connor, Andy Pratt and Dave Hazeman, that sounds very familiar, right? <laughs> and all of these people have argued in the case of the UK, the new Labour's creative industry agenda offered the prospect of a um, meritocratic creative industry without the requirement of a proper industry strategy, nor a radical social interrogation. This creates a fundamental separation between the social and the culture of culture work. Whilst the latter, the culture, has been absorbed by the capitalist market logic, the social has been completely forgotten. 
So my work has been very much focusing uh, on this through the development of the creativity discourse in the global south, where creative industry development leaped out of very different social contexts and the new kind of modernity was always going to be assumed at the expenses of a social disruption. So it's fair to say that created, creativity discourse has created much anxiety amongst observers of culture work. On the one hand, it champions meaningful work, good work, self-fulfilling, which also creates more space for grassroots organization to have a say about strategic policy areas, such as urban culture policy. This new and more open way of working across sectors in public and with through public and private partnership very much suited the neoliberal market capitalism, as Chapello has demonstrated through the idea of the artist critique, culture is working truly in partnership with the market. On the other hand, the legitimacy of the creative industry as an industry sector has been very much challenged from the very beginning because it has it is in no way a replacement to traditional industries in terms of the economic scale. This created a noted level of anxiety amongst policymakers who now uh, inflate the stats by including digital sectors or new media sectors. The DDCMS, Culture is Digital, is a great example of how such anxiety is likely to be channeled into the future for culture policy. In many ways, this creativity discourse is the perfect child of neoliberalism. A stylized opposition to the status quo has been absorbed by the capitalist logic to unite those segments of the society that were shattered, forgotten, and left behind by the global modernization. So to move beyond this, we need to reinvigorate the radical social. The social value of culture work, I should say, has already um, was always there, but it has declined since early 1980s. Previously, the social function of such work was linked to idea of uh, the autonomous artists at the virgin, uh, sorry, at the margin of society and is in opposition to capitalism. And this um, position has been largely challenged by the creativity discourse pitching the sector as new economic growth requiring greater public investment. The validity of the autonomous artists has shifted, so is the social value of cultural work as a consequence of this uh, creativity discourse. So for me, the real issue here is how to treat the industry as how to treat the culture industry as an industry and how to treat culture worker as workers but we face the challenge of the ideal of the culture professional with, uh, with their disinterestedness in questions of the market, which creative industry discourse has celebrated. And this ideal of the disinterested artist has limited scope to address the precarious nature of work because it positions the value of a culture object in complete separation fashion from those who actually work to produce work, produce it. In other words, instead of rejecting culture work as work influenced by rules of the market, we need to acknowledge workers' professional identity as informed both by their industrial relationship to the market and their relationship to society. And this has clearly, um, it, has been clearly explained very early on by Frederick Jameson's work, uh, his book, um, Culture Logic of, the, of Late Capitalism, has a really great take on this issue. He said, the synonymous of postmodernism is when knowledge becomes both capital and labor, but the contemporary creative, creative, cre creative industry discourse only addresses the former which is how to turn knowledge into capital, but they never really properly deal with the fact that knowledge is also labor. Therefore, any refusal to recognize, to re rewards, um, to, to recognize and to, to give rewards to, and to compensate culture labor uh, is wrong. 
and we need to correct that. We need to develop a proper industry structure as we do to manufacturing, to finance, to health and education, so that the social value of a professional culture class can actually be properly registered. The decline in the social value of culture work has resulted in, as we all know, anxiety, alienation and self-exploitation amongst culture workers at the individual level. Um, and also in the growing trend of deprofessionalization at the social level. Deprofessionalization is a term I use to refer to the weakening of the social status of culture workers and their increased marginalization within the economy. Lack of access to upskilling and collective bargaining power, amongst many other things, are contributors to a gradual erosion of their position as professional skilled workers within the economy. In the past three decades, work in the sector has been devalued by declining public trust in the artist status. The trend of deprofessionalization can over time lead to a general kind of decline in aspiration for young people trying to work in the sector as both the status of culture professionals and their economic rewards are so low. The trend of deprofessionalization will result in worsening social protection measures for the workforce. Conventional social protection schemes tend to disadvantage casual workers outside of the standardized employment relations or stable incomes. It's important to acknowledge that in some parts of the world in addressing this issue, um, employment in some of these um, sectors has not even achieved the legal status of a profession. Workers in these countries, I'm talking about developing um, nations in the global so south, they face an even greater challenge as perception of their work are character uh, characterized by the logic of gig workers uh, in the informal economy. So, how do we reverse this trend? Uh, it is important to invest in setting professional standards, including the labor laws within uh, the, the sector through broader policy reforms, which in turn can enable the sector as a whole and individual workers to access relevant social benefits and incentives. I will list four potential pathways to reinvigorate the radical social in the new culture policy imaginaries, but also some of the challenges um, that comes with it. Well, firstly, we need to, we might be able to take arts, we might be thinking about taking arts and culture entirely out of the creativity discourse, which positioning its value as a form of economic input. But to do so, we will actually replace the consumer society with a civic society uh, thinking logic or narrative, at the heart of which is the civic needs, not individual consumer design in relation to culture products. There has already been suggestions towards treating the culture sector as public infrastructures, like we do with public health, public transport, this has worked in some countries, but I think it will face significant challenges and resistance from those countries, including the UK, where the creativity discourse has become so deeply entrenched. The second way is treating it as a mixed economy. So you would have a two tier system, including those that require public funding and those that are happy to operate outside of the system. Can that work? Perhaps, certainly a mixed ownership model has already been happening um, in examples such as co-ops around the world, but this will require a much more open and transparent um, public policy, which is also dependent very much on local context. So I'll use China as example here. The country has always um, had a bit of mixed economy model. The public investment in some areas um, have been uh, very much welcome during COVID, but more questions have been casted on areas such as experimental art that received no government incentives during COVID. Mixed economy 
is not about public versus private, but it should aim at creating these kind of amphibian culture organizations with civic values as its organizational logic. There's a third way is the culture participation model, which has been a key principle for culture policy uh, in Europe in particular. But the challenge here is to respect participation in culture activity as basic human rights without losing the culture agenda entirely into it. This shouldn't be a problem, I believe, if we change the question to what the social goal for participation are, instead of asking what is the culture agenda, we need to have deep dialogues with the broad public to build a collective sense of participation in culture leads to social transformation rather than about individual consumer desire. The fourth way and the last way, I think, is actually the most important and easier to address and practical one to develop a proper social security net to combat casualization and deprofessionalization in the sector. Short term support, as I mentioned before, is never good for deep cut systemic problems. The frustrating issue here is the language of imaginary, as mentioned earlier, of treating the sector as some kind of quasi industry full of bohemians who aren't interested in making money. Following Mark Banks, Justin O'Connor and many others, I believe that the social justice issue should, sh should definitely be front and center in the new discourse as it doesn't just concern uh, culture workers, uh, it concerns the whole society. So I think I will leave, uh, leave it to that. And um, thank you very much and I welcome any questions and comments. Sorry. I how do I stop, stop sharing? Yes, this. Thank, thank you so much, Shin. That was fascinating. Uh, for those who are new, um, hi, I'm Dr. Kimari Spence. I'm the MA convener of the Arts Management and Cultural Policy Program, and I'll be hosting the Q&A segment of um, the showcase. I want to thank again, Shin, for fascinating presentation. We there were lots of different chats happening, all, all questioning, etc. Um, I also encourage everyone to put questions into the chat um, so that we can feed them to the panelists. And also at this point, also like to thank our student panelists, um, Emma Walton, Shui Chen, and Sheena Kelly, who also presented their dissertation work earlier. Um, at this point, I, I saw one question in the chat so far. So before I get to Yunnan Peng's um, question, I wanted to start off with some questions for all the panelists so everyone gets an opportunity to do um, uh, one, one question each, et cetera. Um, there, there were thanks from the audience about just opening um, their eyes to just the global condition or the international condition of cultural workers, um, especially in this pandemic period. So um, for Shane, I want, you know, I was especially given my own research on different parts of the non-West global South, depending on terminology. Um, I noted you meant you started off a lot with um, interwove the, the divide or the digital divide and other divides um, between global south, global north and other um, variations in between. So I um, you know, wanted to note from the reports um, that UNESCO has produced and also the reports you have, have produced, um, have there been any palpable um, changes that have happened in um, whichever sub-segment of the global south in terms of policy um, in the face of the pandemic. Uh, and I ask this question in terms of, you know, a lot of um, cultural funding flawed, yes, happened in the global north and not as much reportage about, so what was the reaction to those um, fault lines when they, um, fault lines in the global south? 
Uh, thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, it's definitely a great occasion to reconnect with you and your research. Um, I think that's actually something that I've been working on as we speak. You know, I've been involved in quite a few projects in um, Thailand uh, since the start of camp, uh, the pandemic, and I interviewed many policymakers in Cambodia and uh, in Vietnam and other places, Southeast Asian countries. And I think the answer to your question is a terrible, not very much has been done. And I think um, previously, um, you know, the sector kind of survived um, by themselves quite well um, because they had strong connections with tourism. So the tourism industry was booming. And I think during COVID, um, due to the decline of tourism, many culture um, industries really declined. And in those countries, um, somehow they never registered culture as a sector and they could not understand any of those talks that we've been talking about, such as the precarious working conditions, such as things like, uh, you know, how to maintain autonomy and creativity, providing space and, and investment in those areas. None of those registered with policymakers in, in the global South. However, I think uh, there is a lot more uh, global um, flow of culture policy discourses during this last two years. Um, previously, everyone's kind of more kept in their local national context except the UK, I should say. UK has been a great exporter of culture policy discourses. Um, but during the last uh, two years, I think the developing global South has had a greater exposure to these uh, discourses around creative industries, not just from the UK, but also from Canada, from the European Union, from Holland, Germany, um, and also from China, you know. Um, so I think UNESCO has done a great uh, job in that um, space. And I think it just shows that culture is one of those things that brings people together, brings country together. And that policy discourse, I think it's really important if we can open our national silos by connecting with these developing countries and to to really kind of see them as equal partners I think that's also quite important yeah. some of these policy developments uh, didn't quite happen that's my understanding in the past before pandemic none of these policy uh, in uh, developing countries was really geared towards supporting what they wanted to do it was very much about uh, kind of enforcing a Western ideology onto them, and somehow they have to copy, go along with it. Otherwise, they will fall, fall apart or fall further behind. And I think the last two years has been very much kind of delve into what is culture mean, what does culture means for us, and develop a policy to address that. And there's a lot of civil society participation in that dialogue as well as we see in in Cambodia a lot. Um, so because it's very much the NGO driving the agenda in that country, whilst the government has no um, idea actually what a culture policy will look like for that country. So I think yeah, uh, I don't know whether that. Address yeah, your no, question. I, I actually, you know, Ali, um, it, we've had um, comments in the chat. Um, it reflects some of the research in Greece. I can say it definitely reflects some of what been dealing with in Jamaica, despite us having a cultural policy discourse, but the support of cultural workers is a very different and cultural rights has not been foregrounded. Um, I just want to follow up before I... Um, uh, move to the other panelists. Uh, we have a question in the chat regarding your presentation of, so why were women's jobs more at risk than men's jobs during the pandemic? I, I can guess that answer. And how can that, you know, what would be the, the specific gendered approaches to supporting and retaining female arts worker, arts and cultural workers? With no offense, I just want to guess. Am I right that the person who asked the question is a man? No. No offense. 
No. no. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's interesting. I still, yeah, still that. But I no. always felt like these questions in themselves are gendered questions because, um, you know, I don't know, men just don't understand women's duty. Maybe most men. Yeah, yeah no. You know, so I think I, I just want to talk about my own experience, you know, as a uh, women working in the field during pandemic you know I have to do all the household chores hold on to jobs and make sure my kids are fed and all, all of that so I think that there are two issues well maybe more than two but I would just outline two critical issues in relation to uh, women's employment in the sector first of all um, women um are more like, according to the stats, women are more likely to hold on to these kind of pre precarious jobs. So then they're not in leadership roles or, or long-term uh, full-time positions. Um, men are more likely to hold on to these kind of jobs and women are more likely to be uh, in precarious jobs. I'm not saying that all jobs are like that. I'm just saying the stats shows that women are more likely to hold on to these precarious jobs within the, the arts and culture sector. And so these are the jobs uh, that got first cut when the pandemic hit. Therefore, women uh, are more likely to lose their jobs because the, the, the how the gendered job market is, you know, constructed. And and I think the other thing is that it's it's to do with just based on my personal experience. I think it's to do with career progression. So for for women, if you reach certain age, you have other duties in life that you you had to move on to and by the time you finish doing all that and come back and you felt like you've already lost your opportunity or your your per career progression and this is less of an issue for men so they're more likely to uh, progress their career um, appropriately or, or naturally whilst women experience more disruption uh, in their career advancement and also, very importantly, that's to do with social security net. The culture sector notoriously do not pay maternity leave. Comparing to other sectors, it's one of those industries because most of the people working there are informal or working a part-time jobs and they are not eligible for maternity leaves. And this is something many countries are now looking into in order to keep women in the workforce, we have to at least provide maternity leaves when they, uh, when those events arise, right? And so that women can feel comfortable, confident to come back after maternity leave to continue building their careers in the sector. So this is so yeah, social, yeah, social yeah, security. Ties, exactly, ties into the whole thing of the social security net. Um, at this time, I'd also encourage our, our other panelists, um, Emma, Sheena, and Shui to turn on their cameras because we have some questions for you. Um, all right, going to Sheena, who presented on dance and, and um, the visual impaired within um, the dance sector, Northern Ireland. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, Sheena, are you here with us? Yes, yeah. I'm here, Kim. Um, so one, uh, what were, what, what kinds of recommendations? So almost in, cause what I found interesting was Shane spoke about a global condition, but each of the three MA dissertations spoke to specific as aspects, access in your case, um, creative labor in Emma's and Shay, and Shay copyright. So with you, what were the recommendations you would have from your, um, from your dissertation, what what would you recommend change? And also from um, Grace, there is, uh, so then what would you change? And also specifically, what are being done to make a lot of these artist space that are generally in old buildings? Mm. Um, are, there, are there any measure to make them accessible? Yeah, so uh, recommendations that I had that came from the research itself, I think there's a lot of value in having practice-based and inclusive research methods. Um, I think it's possible that that can kind of break or fill that gap that's currently within literature and kind of offer a very different perspective um, that's maybe outside of the academia and research world at the moment. So that's more in terms of research. 
In terms of the art sector in general, um, I mentioned in the presentation that consultation and the voices of disabled people are really important and that we have more robust policies that I suppose consider all aspects of access. I know Grace has highlighted there the venue itself, and that's one part of it. But what we find in the workshop is there's so many complexities and nuances way beyond if it's accessible to enter the space. Um, and then she's also asked a kind of it would be a question as well with that is whose responsibility it is. And that was one of my recommendations is that it's all of our responsibility. I think we all have a really important role to play in dismantling the barriers that are in place. We live in an ableist society and in turn, the art sector is also ableist in that sense too. Um, I know there is a few, um, I think Department of Communities have like an access and inclusion fund, which is open at the moment. So I know there's those kind of funds that are in place to look at how your venue is accessible and in turn participation is accessible. So I think there are measures in place um, in terms of really old buildings, I think that's a really difficult question because a lot of those buildings can be heritage. So there's a little bit of a conflict there also. But I think it's everybody's responsibility and we can all make steps to change. Um, one of the things that strikes me about your response, Sheena, is how it, I think all these tie um, relate to each other in some ways is um, the importance of even how we go about finding um, the answers or the data to our research and ties into some of um, what previous speaker Shane was talking about in terms of the kind of discourses, not only discourses about the sector, but even discourses about how do we even find this information, what kind of consultative process, who's at yeah. the table, etc. So um, I think that's important. Who's at the table? Who's in the decision making roles? Um, and in turn, that can make a lot more diverse, whether that's disability, gender, or other. And I should note for those who are from outside Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, the um, cultural policy set up, the Arts Council as it is here, um, is under the Department of Communities, and that is wrapped up in a, a narrative of, well, if you know the history of Northern Ireland, the, the communities and peace between communities, and also social welfare and some of the well-being narrative that um, Shane noted. Um, I will go on to Shui. Hi, Shui. Um, I, please raise comments in the chat, but in lieu of comments, I have questions. Um, so in short, you, you spoke about a chronological development of um, copyright within the Chinese music industry. Um, so in light of its consolidating and monopolistic effects, overall, do you think copyright is good or bad for the Chinese music community? Um, from my perspective, I think copyright has had a significant uh, positive impact on the development of the Chinese digital music industry. And uh, even though we cannot ignore that copyright has promoted a negative decade-long price competition and also has pushed the sky-high cost of current uh, music copyright costs, and uh, however, the strengthening uh, impl implementation of copyrights also has had a healthy development of the digital music industry in China. And also because important the music market has become more regulated and uh, promoting the enthusiasm of those more uh, musicians create. And uh, I think in the most uh, another important thing is just allowing the more Chinese citizens to uh, gradually develop a new understanding of what copyright is and uh, such as it's an important fact that the users cannot listen to and download the, the parity the free music and from either uh, websites or platforms and without a, a copyright license. I think this is very important. 
Okay. Okay. No, I, I, I appreciate the nuance and the answer. Overall, good, but there are different issues in terms. Yeah, of copyright. Copyright yeah. is it has some pros and cons. It it cannot always only one policy and to promote the whole culture sector and such as copyright must. I think copyright must com comply with uh, uh, anti monopoly policy. It's also very important. Uh yes, yes, um and. Would if you had what, what would you change with the present copyright regime? As would you change anything? Yeah, in China, I think government will re regulate this market because uh, not currently the beneficiaries is not the Chinese uh, music platforms or Chinese citizens or Chinese musicians. It's uh, the Western monopoly that the like record labels in, in this situation is very very popular in the whole world. Uh, so there, there has to be, in the copyright, there ha, there's a political economy of copyright in terms of yeah. how, who benefits and the national versus the international, right? Go, go, please raise questions in the chat. I go on to K-pop, I'm biased. Um, hi, Emma. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, you know, moving from the Chinese music industry to the South Korean music industry, um, although we know, you know, the national borders of music are porous. Um, it, you spoke to four generations of K-pop and, you know, the dis discussion from Shuai and, and Shane about, you know, the chronological development of discourses and in Shai's case, the copyright discourse in particular, you know, through exploring, in your exploration of the four generations of K-pop, um, in what ways did you find the K-pop industry responding to the creative labor issues being highlighted, particularly in Western media? I think um, what you referred to as the dark side of K-pop. Yeah, it was actually, it was um, an article um, in by Campbell and Kim and they were like talking about the dark side of K-pop and a lot of when I got into it was like, you know, there are two sides to that industry and it didn't just, you know, it wasn't just established within itself, like it was kind of rooted in the Western music industry as well, like it got a lot of its kind of um, systems from that and it developed from there. So there was kind of a turning point around 2017, the Korean Fair Trade Commission released a report um, after they had kind of probed eight K-pop companies and they set out these like, I think it was like 12 or 12, 14, I can't remember, or seven maybe, um, kind of things like uh, penalties for companies who weren't like following like regulations and things like that, but there was no legal effect to that. So like the ways in which it changed was, I guess new generate like new kind of generations come through like BTS coming through and proving that like K-pop could be a globally dominant sort of um, music genre. Um, they kind of had like a difference. They didn't like necessarily conform to the systems that have been in place in K-pop before, like the cultural technology model that dominated with the you know, training from when you're like twelve years old and learning English, Japanese, South Korean, and like then you know they weren't like that they kind of formed in a different way um but on the flip side of that then the same label formed in hyphen through like a survival show and the survival shows are basically just like a microcosm of the training itself like you do that in a short period of time and you do it for an audience and and there are other problems with that um but then again there were other groups then in the fourth generation like stray kids who have like a kind of joint label with a western music label and a south korean music label and they kind of have like more artistic agency like they kind of have um a lot more say in what they're writing and producing so i think it really depends on the company itself but generally with the music industry like there was like a more open conversation as well about like mental health which had kind of been discouraged um before and that kind of came from like other groups like tvxq and shiny kind of spearheading the way through like really dark times and through really horrible things having to happen um it allowed for that kind of awareness and that change to happen but um it's not that the k-pop industry is devoid of issues now but it's also like 
the Western music industry is in devoid of issues and the K-pop industry has is kind of gets more highly scrutinized because it's not typically like the the Western like white hegemonic industry. So it, it has it has changed and it hasn't changed. It's, well, it's, it's in short. <laughs> not as much as we would like. What strikes me from your answer is, you know, in terms of some of the the remedies, I think it was uh uh, you know, the different views of, um, you know, one of the things Shin had noted is, well, cultural industries as industries, cultural workers as workers. Um, how would you respond to some of her comments? So I'm, I'm, I'm asking the panels about each other, some of her comments from the point of view of the K-pop industry. Um, well, I guess, um, like, in the especially in the earlier generations, like they weren't so much, they were very much seen as like a me, like a means to like as creative laborers more so than like um, workers more so than like artists. So I think that that's kind of where all of the issues stem from. Like they weren't kind of artists within themselves. Like they were like seen as like workers like for a purpose to do what the company wanted them to do so do the music they wanted them to do the concepts that they wanted to portray so I think that's kind of where a lot of the issues stem from is like artistic agency and and, and control but yeah I'd have to have to think about it <laughs> um I have a question in the chat um from Anna Wormald who asked you know do you think the censorship through the money that censorship operates through the management of K-pop groups rather than on a government level. W where do you stand? Is that yay nay or it's complicated? I think um, a lot of the time it is on in the like in the management level, like through the company itself. But the K-pop government relies so heavily now on K-pop as a way of like promoting like their cultural identity, like they make. BTS, AT's ambassadors of culture and like they are representative of that culture so I think on a certain level and uh, they pump a lot of funding into these companies so on a certain level obviously it is the management ultimately that have the control in a lot of the cases but the government aren't necessarily like they're actively involved in the sense that they want to promote it and it's good for the economy and it's good for like forging a Korean national identity but at the same time they're not necessarily like as I say, like with the Fair Trade Commission, they're not necessarily like legally getting involved to ensure that like those workers' rights are being, you know, um, implemented. So it's complicated. <laughs> so I should note we are finishing at two thirty. So please get your questions in. Um, while I await for more questions from the audience, I wanted to know if Shin wanted to respond to any of the three, as I feel they're dealing with um, specific fault lines. Oh, of a general condition that you have spoken to? Um, well, I just thought, uh, just thought of uh, just the K pop question a little bit more, um, as I'm biased as well, like you. Um, <laughs> I am. I'm trying to keep my com comments. <laughs> I can tell from your voice, Kim. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting question about how popular culture. Uh, which was seen as some sort of um, less serious form of culture, or in, in many ways in the Chinese context, um, a lot of those were even underground forms of culture practices. Um, a lot of these are now become mainstreamized and actually being seen as a lot more uh, economically or, or in terms of culture diplomacy, they become a lot more important and desirable for governments around the world. And so in the case of K-pop, um, as you know, Kim, you know, the government actually spent a lot of money into paving out all the international global channels for them to reach the height they, they are at at the moment. And the Chinese government is doing the same with um, changing um, their techniques in terms of the, the kinds of culture forms that they would like to promote to a foreign audience. And in many cases, as you know, um, the um, TikTok, you all know TikTok, right? So the, the Chinese TikTok, the TikTok has different content comparing to those from outside of China. 
And this, this is a very interesting phenomena where uh, popular culture, a creative culture, which presents a, a false sense of freedom is allowed for audience outside of China, uh, for them to look into China, uh, to have a, a kind of false imagination of what the country is, whilst it, within China, uh, a lot of the popular sphere is highly controlled. Uh, so I think there, there's actually, it's not even, for me, it's not a issue that we can laugh about and then forget about. It, it actually raised very significant issue about, as I said, culture's role in society, um, because that varies from context to context. But in many ways, it's a much more serious issue than just who consume what, what makes money, who gets paid. It's actually uh, a lot bigger uh, issue to do with national identity, to do with the power of the state, and also uh, how uh, cultures um, positioning can relate and oppose to that. And so my, my talk today is very much about bringing out that opposition. So, you know, I think K-pop is has done in the past, I believe, you probably know about some incidents, Kim, more than me, um, there have been incidents where such promotion goes against the band's um, desire to reach their potential yeah. market or, or the, their culture kind of message that they want to communicate with other audiences. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of push and pull. There, there should be opposition and resistance to both the market logic and the state institutional uh, power to dominate these culture message, I think. Yeah. And, and a lot of what I'm trying to say is that that radical social has dissipated um, because when industry doing well, get supported somehow, it's not important to talk about that. It, it should always be been, been there and we should always review that and let the underground be underground, you know? Yep. And I think that's the issue in China, all these underground bands that I have been going to for the past 10 years, and now start selling Adidas trainers and hosting these massive um, uh, tribal um, fan parties, you know? So where's the radical? You know? that, that, that's always been our question with K-pop, where's the radical? Um, for those who know, it, it's the indie scene versus the K-pop scene, very different parts of the Korean music industry. Um, Shin, uh, if, could, would, that, would that be your last word? Where's the underground? So I can give each of the panelists a chance to say, you know, 10 seconds, last word. Um, any last words, Shane, before I move on to the other three? Well, just support, support the arts, support culture workers. Uh, it's not just for you, it's for us all, for the future of all societies and roll up your sleeves and join the union, you know, uh, put your money down to, to support uh, your local communities. Just support and get people together to really bring out the radical social collectively. So don't fight it on your own, fight it with your community. Thank you, great point to move on to um, Sheena. Before I move on to Sheena, I will note there is a link um, for the evaluation form for this event. It's in the chat, please fill it out. Sheena, your last message. Well, apart from seconding that, because I think that was a very good last message, um, I would just go back to saying, I think it's taking responsibility that we all, as just been said, have a purpose and a role to make changes and that access is not just about the ramp and the lift in a, in a venue, it's much more than that. All right, so we have support ours, join the union, very much support, <laughs> and take responsibility. Emma, Emma Walton, thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Yeah, well, I third that motion. Uh, <laughs> really hard to follow up on that. And I second what Regina said as well. And just from like um, the research perspective, like don't shy away from conversations that you might not think are serious. Like I didn't think I could write a dissertation about K-pop at the start of last year. Um, I know, but then as soon as I went to my first day, I met Kim, I was like, I am in the right place. So um, 
follow what you're passionate about and yeah don't shy away from any difficult conversations and sometimes you just have to look look deeper and look into the nuance in order to kind of get some new perspective so that would kind of be from the research perspective my my I final difficult conversations and Jay your your point um your last words for us uh, I just uh, think just like a copyright is very important in the culture sector, and uh, but we should know who is finally benefit from this copyright. It's the users, or its citizens, or the, the creators, and all the monopoly uh, companies and these things. Yeah. So she is like to everyone, you know, the 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 workers, etc. Um, I should note, uh, Maria, at this point, please, please feel free to come on, and Maria. Maria for those who are listening, past, present, and future um, collaborators of the program, Maria notes, we take all forms of arts and culture very seriously in our MA program. And Maria, I'll have you close um, this event for us, but thank you to all our presenters and all our attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That was absolutely wonderful. Jin, th thank you so much for a fascinating, um, insightful but inspirational speech on the cultural and creative industries also it's so wonderful to get a global perspective as well as one of our attendees i think catherine raised as well um, and was obviously a huge thank to our, our student presenters as well and um, they're absolutely brilliant i've been working with them to to help do their presentation but they're the ones who've done the hard work last year and through their dissertation process as well and you can see their work is really fascinating um, the, just the, and the links between them, what's wonderful about an event like this is to be able to see the links between the research and the common threads around supporting the art and the significance of art and culture and of supporting each other and collective labour and join a union as well. Um, so I will con conclude by saying thank you very much to everybody. We're, I'm fascinated. Thank you to Maria. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted we're finishing bang on time. It's just 2.30 now. I really appreciate everybody who's given time out of their day for our event, both our presenters, our nights. students, our nights, yes, and our attendees as well. The recording will be added to our YouTube channel shortly, and also the individual student recordings will be added, and you will also be able to see previous videos from previous years as well. And I know we have some of our current students here as well. So this time next year, we will be featuring some of you here with your own research. So I'll conclude by saying thank you to Kim for hosting the Q&A, particular thanks to our guest, Dr. Jin Ju, and particular thanks to our student um, presenters as well, Sheena, Shui, and Emma. And thank you to everybody. And finally, please fill out the evaluation form because that will make our funders and the ESRC and the Festival of Social Sciences very happy as well. Thank you.